Chapter 10 Molson, I love you. Call me back. Holly ended the call, annoyed and worried that it had gone to voicemail yet again. She scrolled through her contacts, calling Molson's brother, Detective Colburn. Pressing the phone to her ear, she listened as it rang. The door to her office opened, and she motioned to her dad that she was on the phone. He nodded and grabbed the morning paper, waiting for her. Colburn. Drew, have you seen Molson around? asked Holly. Not since we all visited Margot in the hospital, admitted Drew. Why, what is going on? I have not seen him since then either. I'm worried that something has happened. She nibbled on the inside of her cheek. It's not like him to ignore my calls. Was anything said that might have upset him? Did he mention he was going somewhere? Drew hesitated. I hoped he was still talking to you. There were a few things said that didn't go over well. I've tried to talk to Molson, but he's not in the house or at the shop. I'm not sure where else he would be. He returned my keys, so I know he won't be showing up at my place. He returned your keys? questioned Holly. He had a copy of my apartment keys and was borrowing my motorcycle. He returned both sets of keys. Drew sighed. He was upset. How upset? Holly wanted to know. Pretty upset, responded Drew. Jana doesn't want him around her children anymore. She feels that his connections to Tremblay and the gangs are too dangerous. I may have agreed that I was worried about any backlash that might happen and didn't want to see Bethany getting caught up in any trouble. You both basically kicked him out of your lives. Holly closed her eyes sympathizing with the pain that Molson must have felt after such conversations. It was a mistake, Drew said firmly, one that I've been trying to apologize for, but I've not been able to find him. Try harder. You're the detective. Do your job and investigate where your brother might be. And when you do find him, tell him I need to talk to him. Holly hung up the phone, frustrated with Drew. Sounds like that gangbanger is finally leaving you alone. Fielding commented as he looked over the business section of the newspaper. It's about time. What is that supposed to mean? Holly's brows came together as she whirled around to face her father. Fielding sighed, folding up the paper. I will admit it. I told him to leave you alone. I don't remotely regret that I did. That man will only bring you heartache and pain. You told him to leave me alone. Holly echoed disbelievingly. Repeatedly, Fielding admitted as he stood, setting the paper to the side. He's a stubborn person. I explained multiple times why a relationship between the two of you would never work. It looks like my words finally got through to him. I'm happy to say I was right. He's quit the residency program, and I think he'll leave you alone now. Molson quit? Holly gasped at her father a moment. He would never quit. It was his dream. Fielding shrugged. He walked out a couple of days ago. What did you say to him? Holly demanded. She knew that Molson would not just walk away from something he valued so much. Fielding had to have done something to push him into that decision. I told him the truth, responded Fielding. He's not cut out to be a doctor. Colburn is some piece of gang trash that needs to go back to shoving drugs on a corner. No decent person trusts him. Doctors need to cultivate an immediate authority and trust with their patients. He can't do that. No one trusts him. You shouldn't either. What gives you the right to interfere in my relationships? She knew her father was only giving her a little of what he had said to Molson. Whatever the full story was... She knew it was likely responsible for Molson's sudden disappearance. I'm your father. I have every responsibility to prevent you from throwing yourself away on some low-life criminal scum. Fielding scowled. I'm here to protect you. That's my job as your father. No, Holly said forcefully. It's your job to give advice, to pick me up when I fail, to applaud me when I succeed, and to love me unconditionally. Being my father does not give you the right to decide who I can and cannot date. You're not dating that man. Fielding narrowed his eyes. Holly was vibrating with rage. She stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with her father. Daddy, do you...
do not make me choose between you and Molson. What if I did? he asked slowly. Then you would lose. Molson never once asked me to choose between my love for you or him. By that virtue alone, you would lose, Polly replied testily. He's a good man. I don't know how he's pulled the wool over your eyes, but he is not a good man, Fielding scorned. Colburn is an insolent, lazy criminal who cheats academically. He's not good enough for you. If he cheats academically, then you would have proof to throw him out of the program, not force him to quit, Holly pointed out. The tattoos he has do not indicate that he belongs to a gang. They allow him to pass through gang territories without any interference. He helps people. He goes through the city's back alleys and forgotten places, bringing food, hygienic supplies, and medical care to people each week. People who cannot afford to go to clinics or to the hospital. People who are forgotten by the system. Molson has been caring for his mother for years. Maybe, if you would visit her here in the hospital, you would know what he's been dealing with. She has multiple delusions, refuses to take her medications, and we've only just scratched the surface of her mental disabilities. I'm not sure she was ever mentally competent to care for three kids. Yet Molson has cared for her when no one else would. He pays her bills. He makes sure she eats. He tried to get her to take her pills. When his brother was wrongfully in prison, Molson vowed to figure out a way to clear the charges and set him free. He did it. You can read all about it in the papers or see it on the news. Michael Ramsley is a free man because of Molson. Molson is a hero for getting to the bottom of the truth. You're always complaining to me about him. When we share dinner or coffee, you put him down, Holly told him. Not once has Molson put you down. Not once has he complained about you to me. When I asked him what he thought of you, he said you take a lot of pride in your work and that you loved me. When I asked Molson if the two of you were getting along, he told me you didn't like him very much. He said he could understand that because Dad should always want the best for their daughters. When you tell me that Molson's not good enough for me, you're wrong, Holly insisted, her voice cracking. I'm not good enough for him. He is amazing. If you would bother to get to really know him, you would know that. You believe him? He's probably taking credit for something he has never done. Fielding fished out his phone. I'm going to call Christian Gaines. We golf together, and he works at Ramsley Pharma. He will know if all of this is true. It is true. I was there helping him, Holly said dampeningly. Gaines, I heard this bizarre rumor. Fielding filled Christian on what Holly had said putting Gaines on speaker so that Holly could hear. I'm not sure about that. The family has been particularly closed-mouthed about what happened. We have all been just so pleased about Michael's release, I haven't questioned it, Gaines responded. However, Noah Ramsley is with me. I'll put him on speakerphone. Gaines told Noah about what Fielding had said. Is there a reason you would like to know this information? Noah asked coolly. Molson Colburn is a student resident at Mercy Hospital, Fielding replied. I'm his professor, and I would like to know if he's telling the truth or not. Molson was instrumental in getting the proof required for Michael's release, confirmed Noah. Our family owes him a great debt. Thank you. Fielding ended the call, a confused expression on his face. It's true. Get your coat. Holly grabbed hers out of the closet opening the door to her office. Irma, I'm out for the rest of the day. Yes, Dr. Ershman, Irma replied. Where are we going? questioned Fielding. To do Molson's rounds, Holly said firmly. I am going to show you what he does. We're going to stop by the soup kitchen. We're going to get everything we might need from a pharmacy, and we're going to walk the city helping those in need. Molson has been gone for three days. Normally he goes twice a week to see these people. If he hasn't done it this week, then someone has to step up and fill the void. If he's playing hooky to whatever obligations he has, it's not your problem, Fielding glowered. No, Holly agreed, it's your problem, because you upset him enough that he's not here. Now you can step up and help, or you can never talk to me again. It's your choice. Are you only going to deal with me in ultimatums now? Fielding grabbed his coat, annoyed with Holly. Until you become more sensible, she led the way. Holly, I love you. I am only trying to do what is best for you. Fielding tried to reason with her as he followed. 
No, you're impressing your beliefs and values on me, Holly impatiently told him. You should have faith to realize that I know what is best for me. Molson Colburn is not what is best for you, he responded. That's not for you to decide, Holly bit out. A few hours later, with sore feet and freezing hands from the constant drizzle the clouds were unleashing, Holly handed out the last of the soups that the soup kitchen had given them. Smells like potato, Jeff sniffed appreciatively. Cream of potato today, confirmed Holly. How's your cold been? It's clearing up nicely. That medication Molson gave me is doing the job. Jeff put away the soup carefully in his tote. I'm headed to the South Street shelter. Molson told me to try to stay out of the weather like this for the next while till I'm fit again. That's a good idea, Holly nodded. What medication did he give you? asked Fielding. He was questioning every person that they had been handing out food or medical assistance to. Holly was growing tired of it. Antibiotics? Holly answered shortly. For a simple cold? frowned Fielding. There was crackling in his lungs, Holly informed him. Molson had let her listen to the stethoscope as Jeff took breaths the last time they were out. Pneumonia, confirmed Jeff. Not too serious. It would have become worse without the medications. Where does he get the medications? Fielding was wondering if it was legal. Does it matter? wondered Jeff. Molson is helping all of us. Without him, we would all be worse off. Have you seen a single wrong diagnosis today? Holly challenged her father. No, he grudgingly admitted. He could not fault any of the medical advice that Molson had been handing out to these people. Can you deny that these people need help? continued Holly. No, Fielding sighed. However, it's against the rules and procedures for unlicensed medical professionals to be giving out medications or diagnosing people. Even if he earned his degree, any hospital that hires him would never want him to be doing a street ministry. He would be bound by the hiring agreement which would not allow him to expose himself to such liabilities of the possibility of being sued in a situation like this. Not only that, but there's a source of the medications to be considered. Over-the-counter meds are one thing. But some of the items he's passing around are prescription only, and I don't think these people are frequenting pharmacies, nor is any doctor writing a script. That is illegal. Helping people is illegal, Jeff weighed in. Just feeding the homeless in this city is illegal. You can get fined for handing me that soup. Only licensed soup kitchens can do that. It don't matter where that soup came from. You're not allowed to give it to me, because I'm homeless. You wanted to give it to Holly? That is legal because she has an address. Sometimes lawmakers forget about the simple humanity of a situation. Laws are put into place to prevent future abuse of a situation, Fielding pointed out. Yet sometimes all it takes is one person to mess up a situation that is working for so many others, causing it to become illegal to do the right thing. What is the right thing? Helping your fellow man when you're able to, Jeff insisted. You tell me that it's okay to let a man starve on the street just because he's labeled homeless. You tell me that it's okay to turn a person away because they can't afford medical care. People judge us and tell us to get a job. I'm 70 years old. I lost everything. I worked for three companies and had three separate pensions. All those pensions disappeared. One company went bankrupt. Another outsourced their pension plans, which were mismanaged until nothing was left. The last pension disappeared when the company pulled up and went overseas. I worked hard all my life, and I have nothing to show for it. There are programs to help people in your situation, Fielding countered. They do help some people, allowed Jeff. Most programs are underfunded, overcrowded, and try to push you into another program. They can't help everyone who needs it. There's too much demand. I tell you right now, if it weren't for Molson helping me, I would likely be dead from this pneumonia. Rebecca's leg would be killing her. Ike wouldn't have the part-time job that Molson found for him. Molson does urge him to use the available programs, Holly inserted softly. He keeps trying to get them off the street when anyone is disposed to listen to him. It is still illegal, Fielding stated. Maybe, shrugged Holly. I intend to keep helping him. You could lose your credentials, scowled her father. 
I could. Holly knew that was a risk. It was one she was willing to take. I only showed you part of where he goes. I'll admit I'm too chicken to go by myself to some of the other areas. We will have to wait for him to come back before doing any more of this part of his rounds. Do you think he's coming back? Fielding half-heartedly hoped Molson wouldn't. He had better, Holly tamped down the worry that she felt. Otherwise, I'm going to cry on you for the next three to ten years, and it will be all your fault since you were part of the reason he left. I'm sorry. What? Holly glanced at him in surprise. I'm sorry, Fielding repeated uncomfortably. I may have judged him a little severely. Thank you. She was amazed that her father admitted to his bias against Molson. Normally, her dad was absolute in his opinions. Holly was glad that she had been able to make him see that he had judged wrongly. Don't get too happy. I still don't like him, and I think he's not worthy of you, grumbled Fielding. Holly smiled. It was a start. Maybe you could apologize to him for pressuring him to stay away from me? Don't push it. Fielding groused. Molson knocked on the door. He could not remember the last time he had knocked on Drew's door. He always snuck in using the copies he made from Drew's spare keys. Then, usually, he would mooch some food and cable, maybe a shirt or a shower before heading out. Once or twice, he even napped on the couch when Drew was at work, when he was closer to Drew's apartment rather than going to Margot's house or the shop. Well, he had a room now. Monthly rent for a tiny room and access to a bathroom, which everyone else on the floor also used. Not ideal, but Molson did not want roommates and he could not expect to live at the shop. He hated his new place. The walls were paper thin, and there was too much noise. The paper was peeling, the window didn't open, and it was not clean even though Molson had spent five hours scrubbing the floor, dresser, and bed. Somehow, it was more depressing than occasionally overnighting with Margot. He had been rotating between the shop, Margot's, and Drew's, telling himself that it was all temporary. Some day, he would be able to get something for himself, something solid that he could call home. Now, that was a distant thought, replaced by the reality of a junky one-room rental that was on the bad side of town. It was all he could afford. It was depressing. Interrupting his thoughts, Bethany opened the door with a smile. She grabbed his arm, drawing him into the apartment. Good, you're here. I was just about to finish setting the table. I'm not staying long, Molson told her. He refused to think of his hollow stomach and the enticing smell of whatever was cooking on the stove. Since when do you turn down food? asked Drew as he cut a loaf of bread. Got stuff to do, Molson replied, shrugging and putting his hands in his pockets. He had lied. Molson was supposed to start work again tomorrow. Other than that, he was wide open for having time on his hands. It was a weird concept. He had been so busy for so long, he wasn't sure what to do with his spare time. Molson had spent part of the day staring at the wallpaper. He was certain the edge of it had peeled down another eighth of an inch. You left a message saying you needed to talk to me about Holly. I figured that was about the only way to get you to come, Drew admitted, glancing at Molson to try to judge his brother's reaction. I didn't exactly lie. I do want to tell you something about Holly. I also want to talk to you, and I had the feeling you were deleting my voicemails. I even called you. Bethany set a pot of stew on the table. There were three place settings. Molson frowned. He had been deleting a lot of messages. He was never so popular before. You want to tell me what this is all about? First, I want to apologize. I made a mistake. Drew set the plate of bread on the table. He turned to face Molson. I'm sorry. I should never have made you feel unwelcome here. While I am concerned for Beth's safety, we both agreed that you are always welcome here. All that we ask is you tell us what Tremblay wants, then I can help you. Molson hesitated as Drew held out the keys to the apartment. No, you were right, Drew. It's better if I'm not associated with you or Beth. 
I don't want either of you getting hurt if I mess up. If we don't know what Tremblay wants, I don't want you to be involved. I am involved, said Drew as he grabbed Molson's hand and put the keys in his palm. You are my brother. And you're going to be a groomsman at our wedding, Bethany said firmly. We've picked a date. That means you cannot welch out on this family. Otherwise, my attendant numbers will be out of order. We can't have that, Drew said in mock seriousness. Molson did not smile. What if Tremblay wants something illegal? You know it's more than likely. Then we figure out a way that you will not get caught, Drew sobered. You and I both know there's not any way for you to get out of the favor you owe. It would be better to have both our heads put together to figure out the solution when the time comes. I told you, sighed Molson. He could feel exhaustion creeping in. I don't want you involved in this. It's too dangerous. Stop it. Bethany gave Molson a hug. We talked it over. We're here to help you, and we want you to keep coming around. Now sit down and eat with us. For once you're actually invited to supper instead of mooching off of us? Drew pulled out a chair for Bethany. Reluctantly, Molson sat. It smelled really good, and he rarely got a home-cooked meal. He still had mixed feelings about letting Drew be involved. What did you want to tell me about Holly? Is she okay? You should talk to her and find out for yourself how she's doing, mentioned Bethany as she dished out the stew. No. Molson suddenly was not all that hungry. He fiddled with his spoon. It's better we make a clean break. Did you tell her that? asked Drew. She's worried about you and upset that you're not calling her back. I thought you, the two of you liked each other, Bethany commented in concern. What happened? I'd rather not talk about it, Molson pushed the stew around. Holly is my friend. I like the idea of the two of you as a couple, Bethany gently persisted. I thought maybe both of you could come to our wedding together. Drew took pity on his brother. Usually Molson would be making some flip remark. The fact that he wasn't told the depth of his feelings. Drew decided to change the subject. Have you seen Margot since the day Jana and I saw you at the hospital? Yeah, she's doing a bit better now, and she's regularly taking her medication. The nurse said they were giving her the liquid kind. Molson answered. He tasted the stew. It was pretty good. Have you been to see her? Yes, replied Drew. She's a lot frailer than I remember. Her memory is not exactly great. She's not doing so well, sighed Molson. Maybe I should have asked the doctors to commit her earlier. I don't know. You thought you were helping her, Bethany stated firmly. We should have been helping you, softly added Drew. What's done is done. Molson did not want to go over it again. It would just make everyone angry. I went by the house, mentioned Drew. Put a new lock on the door so no one would take off with all your textbooks. You never told us that you were going to school. I ain't no more, Molson quietly told him. I dropped out. Why? Drew frowned. I saw your grades. They're amazing. I could not believe that my kid brother is going to become a doctor. Doesn't matter, muttered Molson. I can't get back in any time soon. I lost my scholarships, and I'm not sure when I'll have the money necessary to be able to retake the courses I need to graduate. You intend to go back, then? questioned Bethany. Maybe. Molson didn't know. He had his doubts he would ever be able to return to the program. Of course you're going to go back to school, protested Drew. I want to brag to the guys at the station that you're a doctor. Molson pushed aside his bowl, surprised that it was empty. He decided they had talked enough about him. When is your wedding? There was an opening at the park, smiled Bethany. The last Saturday of May. That's not too far away, Molson remarked. Are you going to be my groomsman? Drew pressed for an answer. Yeah, Molson answered. I'll be there. Good. Drew smiled. Molson crouched down in front of Rebecca to see how her leg was doing. He gently rolled up the dirty pant leg, exposing a bandage. Surprised at how clean it was, he looked at her. Did you go to the clinic? No, answered Rebecca. Got no time for that. Could sit in that place for hours and nothing happens. It gets busy, 
agreed Molson. Who changed your bandage? Your girlfriend. Rebecca cackled delightedly. She's real pretty and nice. Unwrapping the gauze, Molson looked at the ulcer on her leg while he inwardly cursed. He would have to talk to Holly. She couldn't come out to places like this alone. She was bound to run into trouble that she might not be able to handle. There was a reason he had the tattoos on his neck. They were there to keep him safer in unpredictable places, since each of the gangs had informed their members to leave him alone. I'll just put a little more cream on and wrap it up again. Do you have more of that onion soup? she asked eagerly. Nope. Molson wrapped the bandage up again. It's chicken noodle today. I got peanut butter crackers, though. Those are good, Rebecca nodded, rubbing her hands together in anticipation. How is your mother? She's in the hospital. Molson repositioned her pant leg again and put away his supplies. That's too bad, she commented. Is she in a bad way? No, she just needs a little help. Once things get straightened out, I think we'll find her a nice home with other people who have the same sort of condition she has, Molson explained. He pulled two soups and four packages for Rebecca to squirrel away with the rest of her supplies. Is that cartwheel moving better? That oil's a wonder, Rebecca enthused about the two-wheeled cart that held her possessions. I hardly have to push it any more. Just give it a squirt and I'm ready to roll. Good, Molson had a smile. I'll see you next week, okay? Sure will, she agreed, tucking into her soup. Molson gathered up his bags and began to trek down the alley. Further along, he ran into Jeff. Morning, Jill. How have you been? Is that cough still bothering you? Right as rain, Jeff said merrily as he whittled. The last medication you gave me seems to have done the trick. Good. Mind if I listen to your lungs just to be sure? Molson set down his bags, rifling through them for what he needed. That's doable, Jeff nodded. Saw your girl. She and some fellow were talking to Ike down the way. When? Yesterday? Molson placed his stethoscope chest piece against Jeff's back. Take a deep breath. Today, Jeff sucked in air, pausing his whittling while he concentrated. Maybe ten minutes ago? Really? Molson frowned. Let it out in one more breath. Jeff followed the instructions. I haven't any reason to lie to you. Point taken. My apologies, Geo. Molson disinfected and put away the stethoscope. A guy with her? Yep. You get replaced? Jeff asked curiously. She came around with him the other day. I forget his name, but we had a long discussion about the rights and wrongs of this world. It would be pretty quick if I was. Molson wondered who was with Holly. Was it someone she knew, or was it some guy bothering her? Here's your soup, and I got you some packs of flavored rice since you have one of those burners. Do you have enough fuel? Sure do, responded Jeff. Your lungs sound clear. Molson packed up his stuff. Keep warm and dry. You should be good. Which way did you say Ike was? He's over by the back of the Chinese place, Jeff informed him. His limp is worse. I'll see what I can do. Molson nodded his thanks before heading for the alley behind the Chinese place. He saw Ike talking to Holly as another man grabbed a duffel bag. Molson scowled as he approached them. I thought I made it clear you shouldn't come down here without me. I don't want anyone hassling you. Where have you been? Holly dropped her bag and flung herself into Molson's arms. I have been asking around everywhere after you. I was so worried. You should have called me back. I'm sorry. His arms automatically came around her as he glanced at the other man. Molson was shocked to see Fielding standing there. The man was obviously uncomfortable as he waited with a large bag. What is going on? When I found out you'd not made your rounds a couple days ago, I decided to do them for you, Holly explained as she pulled back a little, still holding on to him. You said not to go alone, so I brought my dad since he's a doctor. I said not to go without me, Molson clarified, worried about the danger she had unintentionally put herself in. That's the reason for the tattoos, 
so I can go from gang territory to gang territory without anyone bothering me. There are places you shouldn't go, places where things would happen to you if you go without me. She shouldn't be out here in the first place, Fielding said grimly. I wanted to go. Holly frowned at her father. Holly. Molson tamped down his emotions, slowly releasing her. He's right. I was wrong to bring you out here. You're kidding. Holly looked at him in confusion. This is one of the things that I love about you the most. I want to be a part of it. You are the most precious thing on this earth to me. I don't want to see you getting hurt because of me. Molson shoved his hands in his pockets so that he would not reach for her. You should go. Are you breaking up with me? Holly questioned him. I'm no good for you, Holly. The fact that he was repeating Fielding's words was not lost on Molson. It was humiliating at its worst to do this in front of her father. Some day you'll see that. You're not any good for me. Holly echoed indignantly. She folded her arms. You help hundreds of people each week who would otherwise not be able to afford health care or decent food. You took care of your mother, who is a challenge. You succeeded in getting your wrongfully incarcerated brother out of prison. You're working on becoming a doctor so you can help even more people. Who is not good enough for whom? Holly, he protested, but she cut him off. You give and give, Molson. Who's giving anything to you? She asked, tears in her eyes. I love you. I want to be right here with you. You can't, Molson told her. Why not? She demanded. Because they're right. Everyone who said stuff about me was right, he said miserably. To get Michael out of jail, I had to promise a favor Tremblay. He'll collect, and it won't be pretty. I might be drawn into the gang for the rest of my life. If anything goes wrong and you're my girl, you'll be the first to suffer for it. I don't want that. I don't want you to take that risk. It should be my choice if I choose to stay with you. Holly wiped away a tear. I should be the one to decide whether the risk is worth it to me. What about kids, Holly? Molson used his most persuasive argument, knowing how much she adored children. What if we had kids at some point? Could you live with yourself if their lives were put in danger because of Tremblay? There was a moment while Holly contemplated his words. She jutted out her chin stubbornly. Life is not safe. Things happen all the time. It's who we choose to make the journey with that makes life worth living. Molson could have torn his hair out. He looked to Fielding in frustration. Can't you reason with her? I know you hate my guts. Make her understand. I don't hate your guts, Fielding admitted grudgingly. I can even respect you for what you're doing here with your street ministry. Are you my first choice for my daughter? Not even close. I don't like you. But you are her choice. As much as I don't like it, I will respect it. Molson stared at him in shock. Just a few days ago, Fielding was doing everything he could to make Molson's life miserable, including warning him away from Holly. He wondered what had changed. Molson, I love you. I'm not going to let you push me away. Holly wrapped her arms around him. So you can stop arguing with me right now. His arms stole around her of their own accord. Molson embraced her tightly, giving in. He didn't want her out of his life. I love you, he whispered in her ear and could feel her smile against him. Fielding cleared his throat. Expect I'll see you Monday morning. Don't be late. Say again? Molson was confused. What about Monday morning? The practicum. I'm not going to have my daughter going around with a bum. Fielding groused gruffly. You'll work hard and graduate the program. You're letting me back in, Molson echoed, disbelieving what he was hearing. You need to be there and put in the work, warned Fielding. I also want to know how you've been getting such good test scores. They're nearly perfect each time. Iodetic memory, Molson answered truthfully. I remember most anything I bother to pay attention to. It means I don't need to study. I never cheated. Fielding grunted as he thought that out, then slowly accepted Molson's words. He hefted the duffel bag full of supplies. We better keep going if we intend to get this done today. There are more people waiting. You're gonna help, 
Molson asked, wondering who had replaced his irate supervisor with this moderately grumpy man. The more people you have with you, the safer Holly is, Fielding answered. Molson could not fault his reasoning. All right. Holly took his hand, and they moved forward to continue working along the route, helping people along the way. If you enjoyed this chapter of Unlikely Hero, Book 7 of the Ramsley Brothers series, look for the epilogue. There will meet Bree and Everett. Also consider subscribing to the channel. That way you won't miss any of the new chapters that drop each week. Have a great day and happy listening.